Welcome to Pillow Talk. Last night, Modern Family aired an episode with an eight-year-old transgender actor. The show was applauded for truly living up to its name. The episode talked about issues with diversity, and today we have distinguished Annenberg professor Mickey Turner with us to discuss issues of diversity in Hollywood. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, do you think that there's a difference between television and film when it comes to portraying diversity on the screen? Oh, it's the vast difference. Television has always been ahead of the game. You know, I'm old enough to remember uh, not only Julia, because we went her from Diane Carroll show up a lot, but Cecily Tyson was headlining a show in the 60s, I think it was called East Side, West Side. Uh, Bill Cosby, who maybe never went to mention anymore, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he was uh, co-starring with Robert Culp and our spy back in the early 60s. So they've always done a better job, and uh, the characters on television tend to be a little bit more fully flushed than the stereotypical characters you see in motion pictures a lot of times. Now, I've read some of uh, USC professor Stacy Smith's studies on uh, diversity in Hollywood and how, you know, they tend to hire a lot more uh, white Americans than minority Americans. Uh, and, you know, there's certainly differences um, in age disparity. So what do you have to say about the how they cast, you know, for age and for race as well? Well, here's the thing about Hollywood. A lot of people think that racism is the biggest issue or discrimination. It's nepotism. Okay, because people are hiring who they know and who mm -hmm. they like. And when you look at, say, for example, a Rob Reiner movie, because I see this a lot in his films, you look at the credits at the end, Tracy Reiner, Rob Reiner, you know, so he's hiring his kids, his family, his friends, and that's okay. That's cool. Will and Jada Smith do the same thing. Spike Lee does the same thing. So that makes it more difficult for people to break in on the creative side and in front of the camera as well because you're kind of hiring who you know. And if you look at certain shows like Shonda Rhimes shows, she recycles those actors all the time. You know, she's gonna kill off, uh, what's the guy that played Olivia's lover, um, Scott Foley. If she eventually kills him off, he'll end up on another Shonda Rhimes show <laughs> some, somewhere down the line. So um, it's hard to break in uh, a lot of times. And you know, when you see uh, particularly actors of color, a lot of times they're just plugged in to situations they don't belong in. You know, a lot of people used to complain about friends having no actors of color. But, you know, from my perspective, I'm like, these aren't people I would hang out with. Oh, okay, and that's not a racist thing or anything, but it's just like, yeah, you know. And I, so I could understand how these people would not have black, Latino, or Asian friends, mm -hmm. you know, because they were just in that cluster. Same thing with Sex in the City. So, you know, I think what TV is doing now is you've seen a lot more fluidity in terms of the casting. Um, you know, Fresh Off the Boat does a good job yeah. of this, uh, even though that's, in, you know, an Asian-centric show. The characters that come in and out of there, like uh, the other characters of color, even the white, even the white actors, feel like they belong. Mm -hmm. You know, that they just weren't stuck there to appease the diversity police. So only 2% of the roles on TV are written for LGBTQ um, mm -hmm. characters. Do you think that people of color have a harder time navigating Hollywood and getting these roles because of the confounding intersectionalities between LGBT and also being a person of color or right. being a woman? All right, that's an interesting question. I mean, I'm not really sure that's the case. I mean, there was a show called Noah's Ark Mm -hmm. uh, that played on Logo that, uh, from what I remember, had an all African-American male gay cast, with okay. the exception of one guy I think was biracial. And that show did pretty well for a couple of seasons. I think creative differences down the line really, you know, uh, yanked that uh, sooner than it might have been. But then they went off and did a movie. So I think, you know, those barriers are breaking down. Um, and I think uh, you're seeing a lot more black lesbians on, uh, it's particularly on cable shows and streaming, Orange is the Black yeah. is great for doing that. And then you've got Lorraine, Laverne Cox, yeah. who's not only doing that show, but another show, I think it's on CBS. So they're, they're breaking down those walls too, or those doors. Here's the thing, and this is what I've always said, and I've said this for the last 20 years, the door is not fully open, it's just a jar. And these diversity things, they come in cycles. So now we're kind of in a good cycle, but you know, next year might be a whole different thing. So we'll see. Do you think it's an issue of writing or casting? I think 
it's a little bit of both. Um, Because when you look at the majority of the writing rooms in Hollywood, I've been in a lot of them, they look like you and him. And, um, you know, again, that's the thing where that nepotism plays a role because you're hiring who you know. If you're running a show, you're going to hire the people you've worked with before. And, you know, most typically they are people who look like you. So I think... um, in terms of casting, you know, we have this term colorblind casting. I've never really fully understood what that means. But I think that uh, there's a lot more pressure on casting agents now to uh, sort of integrate shows. And, you know, the way some people get around it, like Les Moonves at CBS, he's like, oh, it's an ensemble, you know, cast. But then, you know, the people of color are saying, yeah, let's go do that. <laughs> they really have no lines. You know, they're really not part of the fabric. They're just kind of there. And I know casting agents and people that are writing these roles are hiring people that look like them. But do you think the audience wants to, do you think the TV viewers are only wanting to watch people that look like them? Or do you think people, based off of the ratings, are kind of more inclusive to different Well, that's an interesting question, too, because, um, you know, I had a roundtable discussion in my class yesterday with uh, millennials about race. Mm -hmm. And um, I think from what I can gather from them, they want to see everyone Mm -hmm. represented. And they're, you know, this is probably the first generation of Americans who's very comfortable with seeing everyone and accepting everyone for whatever they are, gay, straight, black, white. Asian Latino. So I think that there's going to have a time, there's going to be a time when the old guard in the television academy and the motion picture academy are finally kind of pushed out and the new wave comes in. And I think that's when you're really going to see a difference in casting and what's in the writing room and who's directing and who's running shows. And now what do you think is the solution to this diversity problem in Hollywood? Maybe not a solution, but certain Mm -hmm. steps that you know, casting members and writers can go about to increase the diversity in Hollywood? I mean, the simple answer to that is to just do the right thing, you know, but that gets a little bit more complex. It's that, that is a hard question to answer because as long as you have uh, people, the people who are in control of Hollywood, as long as they're still there, uh, it's going to be difficult to fully realize what this should be you know because it's to them it's not about who they put on screen or who they cast in shows or who they hire to write these shows it's about the green so as long as it keeps making green it'll be all right I mean you've got shows like Blackish that are doing well um, although that Disney La- Disney World episode was really whack <laughs> I couldn't I really couldn't understand how you come back for season three with oh let's go to Disney World Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, understanding that it is an ABC show and ABC is owned by Disney, yeah, I get it. The money. Yeah, I get it. But uh, an Empire, you know, is a show that has uh, done well, except for last season. I think uh, there was a lot of criticism because they had that sophomore slump. And from what I've seen this season, it's come back, you know, to do what it does best and, you know, deal with the characters within the Lion family and, uh, you know, all the craziness they go through. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that we'll see more shows like uh, Issa Rae's Insecure on HBO, which is just fabulous. And I think that's a show that resonates with everyone. It resonates with women. It resonates with um, all races because it's very universal in its approach to what that character is going through. And I also like This Is Us because, again, it doesn't feel like forced integration. It feels very natural. Um, I like Donald Glover's Atlanta because, you know, who knew that the little nerdy black guy from Community was going to become this creative force in television. (laughs) Yeah. And, um, you know, that's already been picked up for season two. So I, you know, personally, as a viewer, I would like to see more of that. And I think that was that is what's going to resonate with millennial audiences. All right. Well, Mickey, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook Live and to tweet us.